Welcome to the world's greatest Bronze Age Spider-Man podcast. Here comes the Spider-Cast. I'm your co-host, Mike Allen. As always, I'm joined by... Joshua Mervell. And today we're going to be taking a look at a couple of episodes from the 1994 animated series, Spider-Man. Yes, and we are joined by G.I. Jolie. Hi. <laughs> and that's me that's here. yes last week we did announce that Jolie's niece Abby would be on but unfortunately through scheduling conflicts she is not available this week she had a very important meeting yeah unfortunately yeah. she's very <laughs> business popular meeting. person yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also Bex Luthor could not be with us she also had a very important meeting to attend to Yes. For unrelated, so. unrelated meetings, but a different a meeting. meeting <laughs> um, so anyway, um, okay. So yeah, I guess. I, uh, so we're reviewing three episodes from season three, right? Right. Yeah, episodes four, five, and six. Right. And Josh, um, you're gonna tell us what happened in the first one. Yeah. So enter the Green Goblin. We kind of get a bit of an origin story of the Green Goblin. Um, throughout the series, we do know who Norman and Harry Osborn are. Uh, but to quickly recap, um, there's like a board of directors that makes a bunch of decisions, very important people uh, at Oscorp. And um, the Kingpin kind of see- is part of this board of directors. He, he kind of like seems like he is like pulling the strings in the background and he's got his own um, uh, little plan going on, but an accident happens at Oscorp that um, causes some of the facilities to blow up, and uh, Norman Osborn is trapped inside and um, presumably dies. Uh, Harry is kind of like vengeful, his son, uh, about the whole situation and kind of wants revenge. Peter Parker, who was at the uh, the accident, couldn't save him. And then slowly throughout the episode, um, people from the board of directors start disappearing as this new goblin shows up, the Green Goblin, uh, because in this universe, Hobgoblin came first. So Hobgoblin has already been like established and flying around on the glider uh-huh. right. with like the Oscorp technology. So uh, it's kind of taken everybody surpri- by surprise that this new version of a goblin is uh, flying around New York. So um, one by one, the board of directors are kidnapped um, and uh, Felicia Hardy also gets wrapped up into this because her mother is part of the board of directors. So like while she's trying to investigate what's going on, she gets kidnapped and put into like this underground sewer goblin lair. Um, the uh, Spider-Man ends up tracking them down into the sewer and uh, kind of defeats the Green Goblin. It turns out that... Um, turns out that it wasn't Harry that was taking them. It was Norman who had survived the explosion. And in the explosion, there's like all of this gas that both mutated Norman and the Hobgoblin suit that was locked away in the Oscorp facilities. Um, And it gave him like super strength. Like it's weird. They they say that the fumes transformed (laughs) him, but then they also say that he's using like body enhancing armor. So right. it's kind of like both, I guess. Um, but uh, uh, the underground layer also starts exploding after Kingpin decides to trap Spider-Man and Green Goblin inside while they're fighting each other. Um, and uh, uh, Peter is able to save both Harry and Norman um, as they're escaping, uh, he lies to Harry and says that he defeated Green Goblin as Norman Osborn comes to and he's like back to normal and he doesn't remember anything or uh-huh. presumably back to normal. And that's pretty much where things end. Um, I don't think I'm missing anything. Yeah, there's, that's there's no much like it. pages to flip through. So I, I don't mm-hmm. know if I'm missing something important, but um, yeah, it's it's actually strangely similar to the Hobgoblin uh origins that we were reading with like the board of directors and how he's kind of like tied in with like the corporate side of things and he wants revenge on them and kingpin for kind of screwing him over so uh yeah uh it's it's weird what do you what do you guys think about them kind of like reversing uh uh who came first for the goblins 
Well, I'll just say quickly, it's backward. To me, it's backward. It's like mm-hmm. it's like in DC when they try to make Batman come before Superman. Like it's to me, it's counterintuitive. Like Green Goblin's got to be first. However, they did what they did, and I can forgive it. Mm-hmm. I think this episode was really good. I liked everything about it, except maybe one thing. But Jolie, I'll let you answer Josh's question. Um, I didn't realize that that was what they were doing, so it was confusing. <laughs> I guess would be my short, long answer, because because I didn't know what was happening, like that they had intentionally switched or mm. flipped the origins for who come, came first. Um, you know what? <laughs> uh, okay, I got to think about this. So it's like his dad is wait, his dad's hobgoblin. Wait, the green goblin. Mm, yeah, his dad is the green goblin. Hobgoblin is, I think. It, Roderick Kingsley even in in the show yeah I don't in the know show. Who it is. I can't is remember it? okay yeah I can't uh, remember. It, it, it changes the Harry Norman dynamic and then the Harry Peter dynamic mm-hmm. it makes it different from the comic I think in Harry hates Peter oh sorry Harry hates <sighs> Peter in the movies <laughs> <I'm> right yeah <laughs> confusing all three universes um I think in the comics, he still hates Spider-Man. Oh. If I'm remembering correctly, like he has some sort of vengeance against him. And it seems like that it might be the case in this one if something were to ever happen to Green Goblin. Just because he already knows that like the three of them are involved together. Yeah. I think it just changes. Yeah. So if there isn't anything super detrimental that like sticks out to me just that it changes people's relationships with each other just a tiny bit mm. mm-hmm. well it. okay I'll, and also i just want to say i love the stuff with the board of directors in fact mm-hmm. i didn't realize how much of this cartoon might have influenced the movies Mm-hmm. Because I didn't realize until our last review of the cartoon that this cartoon version of Blade is what directly influenced the movie version of Blade. I had no idea. So yeah. now that I'm yeah, so now Same that I'm watching Same with the Venom origin as well. Really? Okay. Yeah, now that I'm the, watching this episode, uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh you you see um Eddie Brock at the church when the Venom symbiote uh, falls onto uh, onto okay. him after like in in the church when uh, Peter gets rid of it and that's how um, that's how it happens in Spider-Man 3 as well. See I didn't realize that and now that I'm watching yeah. this one I, when I see the board of directors and I mean I, I've read m- many of the Stanley uh, Spider-Mans but not all of them but I'm going to assume that that little turn of events was probably from the cartoon. Right, the yeah. board of directors turning against him, and he him getting pissed off, and him wanting revenge. I'm assuming that's all from the cartoon, but maybe some other Spidey experts out there can correct us. But I think it's like somewhat, uh, but it feels mm-hmm. like it's taking more from the Hobgoblin to me. Maybe it's just because we just read it, and it's so okay. fresh in my mind. Um, right, but yeah, I that's why I think this show was so successful in its storytelling because it almost acted like a script doctor for. Right. all of the comics like it's able right. to take what happened and fix all of the issues that everybody had with it right um, and make it all cohesive yeah 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 I, and everything kind of flows in and it's it's all mapped out because it already happened in the comics and they can kind of like reactively fix the the problems and, and make sure that they connect smoothly right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i do you know okay so i have a question then Mm-hmm. For talking about like continuity comparisons, so the Hardy Foundation, which Felicia's mother Anastasia is part of, funds Doctor Octopus. Cool. So does that mean because we see Felicia, um, at the end, because she kind of ha- gets shoehorned in because her mom's involved, so mm-hmm. she's not Black Cat yet. Not yet. No. Okay. Cool. Also good mm-hmm. to know. Also. <laughs> It was kind of, they they kind of look the same. So like, oh, when, the, the, board of, <laughs> yeah. when the board of directors is all tied up in the basement apartment of the hobgoblin, I mean the green goblin. It's kind of funny. I just, yeah, I, the visual of it was really funny, but also the the visual of the green goblin, um, 
Why did he have a statue of blind justice in his? Oh, that it was layer was it of his be face? Traumatic. That was bad. Yeah, that was bad. <laughs> that to was be... so over dramatic. Yeah. Okay, because like yeah, I, he lives for the drama that this Green Goblin for sure. I scream laughed when I saw that. Like, when I, <laughs> it's stupid. <laughs> yeah, I love it. <laughs> it's so I, stupid. I, will say, I love it. The animation mm. in particularly this first episode was so good. It's mm-hmm. it's better than I think any of the episodes we've watched so far. Especially better than. Um, the Blade ones. Mm-hmm. Yes. With Morbius yes. and Blade. Those ones were so, like, very 80s, ni- like, er, uh, you know, 80s, 90s, choppy, yeah. uh, low budget animation. This one really felt like they took their time to animate it. They had their best animators. Um, it was probably done in studio here as well and not um, outsourced. Um, I also actually have uh, both this and the episode we're going to be talking about in a few minutes with the framed with daredevil um i have a i have dvd copies of a few of these story arcs that they package together as a movie really so they would nice. like take all of like the green goblin stories and edit uh-huh. them together to be one single movie nice wow. so i had that one and the daredevil one it was a spider-man <laughs> versus daredevil uh dvd um, and it it's clear, and I I wonder if they had that in mind if they were gonna like package them together, um, and they made sure that those ones were done at specific studios, because um, because they're kind of like packaged together as like a film, but mm-hmm. That's uh, hilarious. yeah, yeah. Well, I can say that when we when we when we reviewed a few uh, episodes from season two. I was getting worried. I was starting to lose faith because I was like, oh, mm. no, maybe season one was the only good one. But these this batch of episodes we're talking about are all great. Yeah. Like the animation is great. The writing is great. Everything works in these ones. Almost everything works for me. Yeah. Like the, the pacing. Oh, let's talk about the designs. Um, Well, OK, there's more in the second episode, but. I feel like um, a lot of the characters got upgrades, like um, Dr. Octopus got an upgrade. Um, I'm trying to think mm. of some other ones that come to mind. I can't think of anyone's with Dr. Scorpion. Octopus. Scorpion. Scorpion. Yeah, and he's got like look- a mechanical right. like, and, blaster tail. And they all look great. Like, mm-hmm. in, a, in a completely different style than Batman. Batman, the animated series, went more like uh, f- uh, film noir and art deco or whatever. Or even German Expressionism. But this show was just more like, no, screw it. We're just going to go ultra modern, make everything look yeah. kind of cool and a little bit manga-esque, a little bit. But I just love it all. Like, throw tradition mm. out the window and just give them new designs. I love it. It's great. Yeah, it, it really feels like uh, the vision of the future from the 90s. Like, it's, right. it's, very, it's a very, like, futuristic of its time. Yeah. Um, and even today, I think it still fits because it just feels like a style almost like how the incredibles uh movies were like futuristic 60s like the vision yes. of what the future would be like in the 60s this really does feel like uh that for the 90s and it right i i think that tone totally fits today i love the um the blasters like they they don't have like guns they've got like futuristic laser blasters in this one um all of the tech is like that kind of like big chunky mechanical look to it uh green even green goblin's glider in this is so freaking huge like he's got this little mini one that docks into this huge like maybe like 15 foot 20 foot wide glider right yeah yeah so great yeah yep (laughs) <laughs> oh, and almost, I'm sure some of that too is like, oh, we got this cool green goblin toy we got to sell. Make sure yeah, you add sure. that. But I don't know. It's It kind of adds to that like 90s charm. Uh, yeah. I like but, a little glider that you can talk into a big glider. It's yeah. like having like a little, a little purse and a big purse. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, okay. Now here's the one thing. There's one thing I didn't like about this episode and that was Green Goblin's voice. Yeah. I hated I, his voice. I, 
I don't think it, I kind of noted that too. I don't think I hated it, uh-huh. but when you compare it to both Willem Dafoe, yeah, uh, and how iconic that was, and Mark Hamill as the Hobgoblin earlier in this uh, show, right? It's it really does fall flat. I think that they had the uh, voice actor for Norman Osborn cast already, and he right. had been showing up throughout. So when it was time for him to turn into the Green Goblin, I feel like maybe he just wasn't. He didn't have like that energy to bring to the Green Goblin. It would have been maybe even better if they just completely had a different voice actor for the green goblin lines True. and still had the norman osborne voice actor yeah. um why didn't they figure so, that out before yeah they cast him but anyway yeah sorry jolie what were you gonna say so apparently we should be at least michael should be familiar with this gentleman's voice he's somebody named neil ross and he oh, voiced oh you mean the voice of is it Dusty duke and judge Okay. No. Is he okay. Duke as well? No, he's not. No, but I know I I noticed that, yeah. Let me just see here. Neil Ross. Yes. Yeah, so he's Dusty so he- and Shipwreck. As well as four Transformers. Hmm. So he's Bone Crusher, Hook, Springer, and Slag. Okay, oh, okay. Springer is in my heart. Can I just say that me <laughs> if he did Springer, that means he also voiced Keith from Voltron and Herc Armstrong from Inhumanoids. So the leader of Voltron and the leader of Inhumanoids. And Springer was the coolest character in Transformers Season 3. He's awesome. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, Springer's really cool. Yes. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> uh, I think we li- I think we stand the uh, Green Goblin voice now. Yep. <laughs> so we take it back. Uh, no, yeah, it's... It- it, it, what, didn't, so it, it, it was, fell flat, I think. Yeah, it did. It did. Yeah. I don't know why, but <laughs> anyway. I, I think oh. it's that bias. It's that Willem Dafoe. It, it just, I, I wanted to hear that, like, uh, mm-hmm. like that, like, crazy right, Willem crazy. Dafoe voice. Like, oh my goodness. And then, yeah, with the Hobgoblin too. Mark Hamill is a fantastic voice actor and totally embodied hobgoblin mm-hmm. like i i wanted some of that will of the fun. that's some neat right. trick something yeah it just was yeah. weak and i i guess in a way this episode was great but i feel like in the end it shortchanges green goblin by mm. putting him second and also giving him this weak voice so mm. other than that i think it was a great episode but that that's my final take on it uh gi julie what do you think of the whole episode in general? Yeah. It was, it was good. <laughs> I liked it. I liked it for all of its, like, ridiculousness, but also it wasn't as ridiculous as it could have been, you know? It was, like, believable ridiculous. It was fun. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> uh, Josh, oh, no, that's okay. So, Josh, what's your final take? Yeah, I uh, I like this one. It's probably my favorite of uh, of the three that we watched. Uh, super nostalgic for me watching this growing up. So uh, yeah, it's a it, it's a good one. I totally agree. And uh, I guess with that, we're gonna jump to the next episode, which is titled. What was it titled? Or is it just titled Rocket Racer? Yeah, I think it's Rocket Racer. Yeah. Okay, so this character, again, is close to my heart. I love Rocket Racer. Um, so this episode, and again, I'm going from my faulty memory, but basically, what's Rocket Racer's real name? Here, let me just look it up here. Uh, Robbie. Robert? I think his name is Robert, yeah. Robert Racer. Okay. No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Robert no, Farrell. It's, uh, Robert they Farrell. Okay. Farrell's Grocery. Right. right. Yes. So Robert Farrell, oh boy, guys, help me out, but... He's hanging out and he gets mixed up with the wrong crowd, right? And some people think that he's committed a crime, but he doesn't, right? Well, some people are robbing a bank nearby where he happens to be, which is right. weird. And uh, they mm-hmm. drop money and <laughs> yes. he picks it up. But they have made their escape. And just as 
the cops get there. Oh, a criminal named Big Wheel. Is some in oh, his gang. Yeah. Yes. So um, awesome. So he picks it up and's like, "What's this? What's going on?" And like the police obviously um, think that because he's black and holding money um, in the middle of the scene of a bank robbery, he must be the culprit. So they haul his ass away to jail. You can continue now. <laughs> so basically, you know, yeah, like you said, his family owns like a grocery store and his mom he, and he he basically has this attitude like, well, if everyone thinks I'm a criminal or a thief, I might as well be a thief. And his mom is like, no son of mine, blah, blah, blah. And like gets him out of jail. And then he figures out he basically breaks into the headquarters of this big wheel organization right and he steals their technology because they've been using this big wheel to rob banks he steals like there's basically a table with all this stuff on it and he throws into a backpack and takes off then he goes home and he reworks it all to create his own costume and he creates a kind of superhero costume uh that's glorious red and yellow and he has like a magnetically powered skateboard that kind of floats right Kind of mm-hmm. like uh, Michael J. Fox in uh, Back to the Future 2. It's yeah. awesome. And I don't remember. What is he? What is his first thing that he does with it? I don't remember. Does he attack? The- he goes and uh, he's about to start robbing a jewelry store. But then yes. after like grabbing one of the, the jewels, he kind of like has a change of heart. And he's like, what am I doing? And he leaves it there and doesn't actually um, steal anything. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And then, I, of course, again, my memory is faulty. I don't remember what else happens. But in the end, he ends up teaming up with Spider-Man, right? That's all I remember. What ends up happening? Yeah. So he Spider-Man chases him and uh, he ends up getting away from Spider-Man. They do have uh, a fight, though, right? Yeah. He, it's more of like a chase. And then, like, he gets trapped underneath the elevator that's going down. And then Spidey saves him and he, like you know weasels his way out of the situation but then later on the big wheel gang is chasing him down uh, because they want the stolen technology back so the two of them team up to uh stop them right um and then they win the good guys win in the end they sure do (laughs) and yeah i uh again i thought this episode was great there's a lot of things like I like the updated design for Rocket Racer's costume, but, it, you know, it was still faithful to the comic, but it was updated, right? Mm-hmm. I love the Rocket Racer's power. I love that, you know, a lot of times in the 90s, the Marvel and DC comics skirted around real world issues, especially of race, and almost pretended they didn't exist. And I like the fact that the, you know, Rocket Racer in this show, at one point he says something like, what does he say? Something like, oh, a brother can't do this or whatever he says. But it's like, no, kids can handle this realism. They, they can handle real topics. The fact that, you know, um, the black people are treated differently by cops and treated differently mm-hmm. in a lot of uh, aspects of society. You know, like I just watched West Side Story. If this 1960s musicals can handle it, then I, a 90s cartoon can handle it, I think. So I really appreciated that. And, uh, you know... A, a new character, a different kind of character, a new kind of character for Peter Parker to interact with. So I thought this episode was, once again, they're on a streak here because this episode was really good. I thought it was great. Uh, <laughs> G.I. Julie, what did you think? Yeah, it was pretty cool. Uh, I thought that he was going to turn out to be white. No, it's nothing. It's funny. Okay. Sorry, let me come up to your level. Oh my God, I thought it was so cool. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> There's black kids on roller skates and he was climbing a building yeah. using magnets. Woo! It was amazing. <laughs> I honestly thought that Rocket Racer was going to be the villain of the piece. But well, when he good. turned out not to be and he turned it turned out that he was going to use science for good. Yes. I was excited. Yes. <laughs> right. Yeah. It was so funny because he at the beginning he was like um cuz in the in the cartoon we see that Peter is like teacher peter and peter tells him hey use gyroscopes and i bet you you know if you read a little bit more about gyroscopes it'll help you with your project and it turns out he like uh robert goes and he reads every single book on gyroscopes and is able to create this like bomb ass project and then 
Uh, Peter sees it, but then he's like, uh, oh, I don't have time. I work in my mother's grocery store and I'm just going to be marked as a criminal my entire life. I don't have time for right. science. But then he thieves all of the technology from the big wheel gang and creates what they nicknamed the Rocket Raiders, which is just him mm-hmm. and Peter. But <laughs> well, yep. Spidey, I should say. Um, the news, does the news coin that? Like they show them together on the news. And even Spider-Man's like, I guess I'm in a gang. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so... Yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. think it was like the newspaper, yeah. Cool, that's it. So science wins in this episode, and any time science wins, we win. We so. win. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I'm trying to find the quote. Like, I'm furiously scrolling and trying to find the quote that you're looking for while I talk. Well, and, uh, I- I'm just going to interject while you're looking for that. Again, yeah. one of Stan Lee's, you know, one of the things I love about 60s Marvel superheroes is almost all of them are scientists. Reed Richards, Bruce Banner, Peter Parker, Hank Pym, Tony Stark. They're all scientists, right? And I love that fact. And this episode with Rocket Racer, you know, with that little, it almost, I don't even know what it is, but that gyroscope little thingamabob thing that he has. I'm like, oh, this is great. If I saw this when I was a little kid, I, it would have made me want to be a scientist, right? Mm-hmm. But instead I was watching Inhumanoids. So, well, I became <laughs> nothing. But anyway, they were all scientists too. It wouldn't have helped. Um, Julie, did you find that... Uh, was it when he was talking to his mom? Where he's like, I know I was wrong, but since everyone thought I was a thief, it just seemed like the easiest way to help out was to become one for real. I think I so. I just couldn't go through with it. I'm not a crook, and I guess I really am a scientist at heart. <laughs> so yeah, great. perfect. Yeah, uh, yeah oh, I yeah. I remember reading about him in the comics. Sorry, Jolie, did you say... <sighs> There's another one. Just one more. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everyone wants me to get back into science. Cool. I'm with that. But this time, it's going to pay. And then he steals Uh all kinds of technology. But anyway, okay. You read? Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Him in in the comics, the story is not as powerful or like stuck with me as much as it did um, here in the show. Um, I think that he was like a perfect level of like kid sidekick for spider-man because it seems to be kind of like a theme that happens not just to spider-man but like a lot of superheroes like teaming up with kids who also want to be superheroes um his costume is great i love that he starts out like spider-man being a scientist um and he even becomes a superhero for the same reasons that Spider-Man becomes a superhero. He does it for money. Mm-hmm. Instead of uh, being a wrestler, he's just going to go take some some jewels from the jewelry store mm-hmm. and pawn them off and get some cash to pay for his sick mother's medicine. Like, it's it's all... He's doing bad things for good reasons. Right. Um, and if that's like the making of a, of a perfect superhero... Um, so yeah, I really like his character in this. I love that he turns it around by the end. He, he's he's like a cool teen. I think even teens today would find this guy cool and rad on his hoverboard. Yeah, yeah. This was a good episode. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was so it was almost believable, Josh. I didn't know <laughs> there is. I yeah, the enthusiasm spot mm. on. What about you, Mike? Well, I loved it. Okay. Yeah. There we go. There we go. <laughs> done I loved and done. His voice. Actually, you know, we talked about Green Goblin's voice. I loved Rocket Racer's voice. It was great. Yeah. Oh. I think that maybe the dialogue was a little uh, adult writing a kid at times. Yeah, you could but, that. Yeah. But other than that, like, it's, I mean, it's hard to, to like, nitpick to that level in a, in a cartoon, but... Uh, it was good. I liked it. Right. Me too. So mm-hmm. I guess that's another one we recommend, right, guys? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So I guess we are going to jump to our final episode this week, which is called Framed. And Josh, are you going to summarize this one? 
Because unfortunately, I don't think Jol- uh, Jolie could summarize it. Yeah, sure. Okay, so this one is a little strange. So feel free to jump in and whenever you want and help sure. me out on the recap. Because a Can lot just... kind of yeah. happens in this oh, one. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, no. Oh. Okay, so we start off this episode getting thrown like right into the middle of the story um peter parker is in court and is being taken away to prison for some sort of crime and in the police cruiser as they're taking him to the facility um the like police car lineup gets attacked by a helicopter and spider-man it breaks into the police van that he's in and kidnaps him and escapes in a helicopter. Um, and we get kind of like a freeze frame moment as Peter Parker narrates like, I guess you're wondering how I got into yeah. this situation. <laughs> <laughs> we, we flash back to uh, what's happened before. And we learn that um, Peter Parker gets contacted by Richard Fisk, who is Kingpin's uh, son, who we all know as the Rose now, uh, <laughs> reading 80s comics. So it was great seeing him with a mullet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Definitely. the 90s. Uh, so Kingpin uh, offers him a job doing like data analysis and like just like transferring data, like doing science things. I don't really yeah, know exactly. exactly what it is. It's, I don't even think the show really knows. He's doing some sort of data thing. Um, and Same thing you do, right? Isn't that what you do, data? No. Yeah, I do some some sort of data. Data, yeah. Some science. <laughs> I okay. click keys. <laughs> uh, so uh, he quits his job at the Daily Bugle because he's making lots of money now. Um, he, We see him like, burn some of this data onto a cd right um and as he's leaving work uh he is stopped by uh this woman who's disguised as like a hot dog salesman and he quickly changes back into his his spider-man clothes and uh gets away and as he's going to visit aunt may he gets arrested because it turns out that that woman was an undercover cop and the data that he has on that cd is like uh weapons information that he's leaking to other companies so he so essentially what's happened is uh peter parker was hired as a setup as like a fall man for the kingpin and richard fisk so they set him up as this person that's been like leaking all of this information and selling like weapons data to other countries or bad guys or whatever is going on um so uh that's kind of where we're at now um yeah i can't remember how he gets out I can't how remember gets- how he, I can't remember how he escapes. Who? Peter? Oh, okay, I remember. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Uh so after uh he gets arrested by the police, uh it turns out that uh 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 Daredevil is his lawyer, mm-hmm. Matt Murdock. Um and uh so we kind of get like a little bit of introduction to his character and then we cut to him being kidnapped uh (laughs) peter parker being kidnapped uh and they bring him to this facility and they pretty much tell him that yeah he was hired as the fall guy thanks for everything and now we hired chameleon to pretend to be spider-man so now both spider-man and peter parker are guilty and uh we're gonna kill you now peter and everybody's gonna hate spider-man for freeing this uh villain and uh see you later so they lock him in this like tube uh that's only got so much oxygen so he's gonna soon suffocate and it's built with extreme titanium so it's unbreakable not even spider-man can break out of this right, right, right. uh daredevil goes to the facility beats beats up a bunch of guys and frees peter parker from the cell um and daredevil kind of like drops him off to his apartment tells him to like you know uh 
rest up a bit, but of course he doesn't. He dons his Spider-Man costume and he goes back to the facility to see what's going on. We get a recap of like Daredevil's, we get, sorry, a flashback of Daredevil's origin um, uh, when he was like, a kid and his dad was a boxer and he resorted to crime to you know put money on the table and uh he saw his dad committing a crime and like robbing a bank and being upset about it he runs away and a truck full of acid well well, i think it's like radioactive waste radioactive waste and (laughs) it blinds him uh and his dad uh finds out that it's actually wilson fisk who's like transporting this illegal substance through the city so uh his dad is murdered by wilson fisk off screen and uh yeah so then we we now know that daredevil's a good guy and his superhero origin they both uh start investigating uh fisk tower and um the, the goons start like blowing up the place to try and like hide all of the evidence and we're left with a cliffhanger while Spider-Man and Daredevil team up to escape this like burning building. Mm-hmm. I think right. that's it. I think that's how it ends. I'm trying to remember. The, yeah, they're, they're enemies at first because Daredevil thinks that Spider-Man's a bad guy who kidnapped Peter Parker. Um, right. But obviously, uh, they get over their differences and they team up to fight these goons and escape the uh, the exploding building. But yeah, it's a it's another pretty good one. I don't think it's as strong, in my opinion, as the other ones. Maybe it's just because we only got half the story. Um, I do remember liking the second half as a kid. Like I remember liking the Spider Man and Daredevil team up. Um. But I thought, yeah. see, I thought this episode was good. First of all, I got to give them props for starting off in the middle of a, yeah, like a, I guess, and on medias res or whatever it's called in the middle of the story. And then you're probably wondering how I got here. And then they flash back. <laughs> okay. Of course that's a cliche, but it's still by cartoon standard. That's pretty experimental, right? That's not something mm-hmm. you see every day. So I admire them for doing that. Um, and then you're wondering some... how I was locked up for treason yeah (laughs) yeah like how did peter parker get mixed up in this treason's like a felony Uh uh-huh that's it's big anyway (laughs) but but also not not only is it told the flashback that there's also the added twist of how is peter parker being broken out of the van or whatever it's called by spider-man right right so it's an additional mm. like what the f kind of moment um and so there's those two things and then the fact that spider-man mixes so well with daredevil i find right i yeah. just love in the comics when they team up they are the perfect foils for each other because they're just left and right of like the the the, the i guess morality you could say like mm-hmm. they're you, you, you're never quite sure who to side with, but they both always have their point. It's not two extreme points of view. They're both just subtly off. But So usually when superheroes fight, it seems gratuitous, but when these two argue, it seems real to me. And I think that worked in this episode. Once again, though, the only thing I didn't like in this episode was Daredevil's freaking voice. I didn't like the choice yeah. at all. For yeah, this guy. he they sounded like an Daredevil. old man. Right. Like, he had such a d- super deep voice. Um, wow. <laughs> what? This is the 90s? Yeah. Yeah. So, th- yeah, well, I mean, Edward Elpert was born in the 50s, so he would have been almost, like, 40. Old- he mm-hmm. was much older. Old piece of shit. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I think the voice, the voice was good. I just don't think that it matched daredevil right the the voice acting was not bad no like it's not like it was like wooden or we like it was just it just didn't feel like it fit the tone of the daredevil character in the age like it just wasn't an appropriate voice um yeah i'm just like this would have been a good voice for blade (laughs) instead of whatever the heck blade remember how awful blade's voice was yes uh yeah i feel like this this voice fits that kind of like 
dark, serious character. It's like a super uh, deep voice, but because it's like smooth as well, it's kind of has like a commanding presence, which I don't feel from Matt Murdock. Maybe, maybe Daredevil, if he's put like putting on a voice. Right. And then if that voice actor did like a softer voice for Matt Murdock, but like I didn't, I didn't buy that, you know, lawyer Matt Murdock talking to Peter Parker would sound like that. I I agree. I totally agree. Um, It was very like aggressive male porn star. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You could say that. And now, like apparently- n- learning more about Edward Albert, though, it's it's he he was like quote a serious actor that they asked to do a voice role. So mm. he had like one Golden Globe. He was in a movie with like Goldie Hawn, apparently, oh, okay. um, hmm. in the seventies, and like up until then had a very serious film career, and went on to be. Uh, the voice of our intrepid lawyer and also the Red Ranger in Power Rangers Time Force. But hmm. I don't want to say he fell from grace, but <laughs> it, 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 it was like he he's what I, I would imagine like a Ken doll would sound like. It wasn't like fitting. Hmm. Hmm. Ken, yeah. Ken's dad? <laughs> Yeah, yeah it was too it. yeah it was just like too deep and uh it was too much of like a presence right for for matt murdoch for sure it's almost like they had a really cool voice and they wanted to throw it in somewhere but they didn't know where to put it mm. so they just randomly picked daredevil yeah now unfortunately yeah. i didn't realize that daredevil only appears in i i guess this episode and the next one that's it mm-hmm. which is really unfortunate because I, I was looking forward to more daredevil but I thought he really worked. I mean, his character really worked in this episode. And overall, I thought this episode was pretty good. Also, I like the fact that... I can't remember. Has the Rose been in this yet? No. Wow. I don't believe so. Okay. So they're bringing in the Rose. They're, they've got the Kingpin. Now, the other thing I didn't realize until this batch of episodes, I had no idea that the public did not know that the Kingpin and Wilson Fisk were not the same person. <laughs> I didn't realize they were playing the Kingpin as like a secret identity. Did you guys know that? No. Yeah, I, I I thought that was the case. Even in the comics, they always talk about this kingpin figure that's like behind all of this crime, but they don't know exactly who it is. And but for some reason, I thought that Spider Man already knew that kingpin was behind it all. Because th- was it was he not in Kingpin's headquarters fighting Hobgoblin? That's what I thought. I don't know. Yeah. I, I thought that Spider-Man already knew. So I was super confused as to why Peter would even take a job with him. Right. <laughs> like, I, I was like, what? This doesn't make any sense. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, yeah, for some reason, I maybe I'm wrong and I'm mixing up uh, what we've been reading in the comics. But I thought that Peter already knew that Kingpin, Wilson Fisk was the Kingpin. But... Yeah, I don't know. Mm. That confused me. But otherwise, I thought this one was really good. Mm -hmm. Um, Jolie, you enjoyed it from what you saw? Yes, I did. Including the part where he broke out of the van on his own the first time. Yeah. Uh (laughs) So silly. Most of it was silly. Treason? I don't know. Whatever. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it does seem like a crazy crime. To just hire this dude to fall on like now knowing like technology and stuff you would know that he would have been hired on after mm. all of this like data was put into their computer systems so it couldn't possibly have been peter but uh so yeah it seems like a really weird thing for him to go to prison for right Although, like there's no I- other in like he just had a cd in his hand right, right. I got to give them props, though. I think it's a pretty interesting um, twist to hire him for that job. And mm-hmm. he thinks he's kind of like, oh, look at this. I can finally quit the Daily Bugle and blah, blah, blah. But then he ends up getting framed for this crime. So I thought that was cool. Especially for a cartoon. Right. Is Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, I, in, yeah. In the 90s, it 
seem yeah yeah it, it's it's good <laughs> yes. I, I have like i have obviously like small problems with it it's not a perfect story but uh-huh. uh, as far as like 90s cartoons go it's really fun uh, especially ones based off of comics that were made to sell toys really like right that's what these ty- same with like transformers and gi joe like any any uh cartoon from like the 80s and 90s it's mostly for that purpose it's the merchandising it's yep. the it's the toys it's all of that stuff so the fact that on top of that there's like some pretty great stories going along with it uh it's really good it's super fun well okay i made this point on flea market fantasy last week where i was saying how like our generation we hold comic book creators on such a pedestal but mm. those same people have no respect for the writers and artists of cartoons from the exact same era, right? Mm-hmm. So we can read and reread and pr- put heap praise on certain 80s writers and artists, but then those same people look down on like, oh, G.I. Joe and Transformers. Those were just <laughs> advertisements for toys. And I, and I said to these people, if you think Spider-Man comics are anything less than a commercial for toys you're dreaming like yes Mm -hmm. of course they're good and and we can hope that they're good but at the end of the day they don't make any money from the comic books they're just there as lost leaders for the toys and the merchandise and the t-shirts and the lunch boxes that's where they make their money so all it's like you just said josh everything like when i was a little kid i thought it was the reverse i thought oh there's a transformers cartoon oh look and now they've made a toy based on the cartoon how little mm-hmm. i knew it's the exact opposite the cartoon yeah. is a commercial so and so is this cartoon yeah and i think if i'm not mistaken jm de matias actually had uh quite a bit to do with the stories that were being told and what, what was like helping to write this show i haven't so seen his he, name but he, it's possible because he's yeah done a I, lot I, of animation so I know I think that his name has come up before. Yeah, I know he's he's definitely a part of it. I think earlier on in the show, at least, um, he was kind uh-huh. of there helping to translate it from comic to um, to to show. I don't okay. know if he was necessarily like writing the scripts every time, uh-huh. but he was definitely there um, during the process of the uh, uh, of the show. Okay. Okay. Mm. Uh, so Jolie anything else to say about this one for me mm, yeah maybe I don't know (laughs) there's like a lot of other little things that like we could talk about but I don't know that it's like totally worth it Mm. so so no okay (laughs) Uh, Josh yeah it's it's a good one i think that um this is a really great example of them translating uh the, these types of stories to tv um i think all three of these uh episodes have pretty good themes uh great animation uh uh there's like some adult things happening in all three like they don't shy uh-huh. away just because it's a kid's cartoon made to sell toys like they they're they're not always pulling their punches um which is nice to see uh it really feels like they're just telling a cool story and not a cool story for kids uh-huh so yeah i it's, agree uh, it's fun yeah i would definitely recommend this for people that are like interested in watching uh spider-man beyond the movies that we've got Right, I think and this kind of has has the the heart of Spider Man and and the, the, those types of like serious, not necessarily serious all the time, but like fun comic stories. I agree, and uh, again, after a shaky season two, I can once again see why this cartoon is so popular because this batch of episodes from season three are really good. Mm. So I think we all recommend these ones then. Yeah, it's a good batch. Uh, So, yeah, we are going to be reviewing more episodes of the cartoon in the next year. So be sure to join us because 
We're not going to review every episode, but we are going to do a sort of uh, grab bag of episodes here and there, and we're going to make our way through the whole series. So stick with us for that. And next week, just so everybody knows, it's going to be a special one. Again, it's always a special one, right? <laughs> next week, we are going to review oh regular episodes or regular issues of the series. <laughs> Amazing Spider-Man 301 <laughs> with the return of um, Silver Sable. And uh, let me just check my list here. And then also Web of Spider-Man. Uh, one second here. I want to get this open. Uh, Web of Spider-Man uh, 39, which features the origin of the man called Tombstone and Spectacular Spider-Man number 139. Wait a minute. No, I got that backward. We Sorry, Spectacular Spider-Man is Tombstone and Web of Spider-Man is Retribution. And it's a fill-in issue, but I'm sure it's still good. Yeah, so anyway. last time we had a fill-in, it was pretty good. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, so uh, I want to thank G.I. Julie for joining us. And hopefully Becca <laughs> will be with us next week. And Josh, yeah. you can take it from here. Yeah, we want to thank you guys for listening to the podcast. It really helps when you leave us a review over on Apple Podcasts or on YouTube or on our website, comicbooksyndicate.com. Uh, please let us know what you guys think about the comics and the TV show uh, that we're talking about. We want to keep that uh, comic conversation going. That's right. So until next week, see you later. Ah!